estimate uh, the adequate uh, sample, then we need to uh, draw that sample from the population. What are different techniques through which we can draw that sample from the population? And then we are going to talk about parameters required for uh, sample size estimation. And I think this is one of the most important part of this session uh, that we need to learn about and that we need to uh, think about. Uh, we'll talk about sample and non-sampling errors as well. And then first we'll talk about uh, actually how we can estimate sample size uh, for various uh, research or study design uh, by utilizing or by using various sample size calculators and formulas. And finally, you folks are going to have uh, the chance to ask the questions. And we'll try to answer uh, yeah, your questions as many as we can. Uh, so definitely, you will have the chance to ask questions. And meanwhile, you can also uh, write your questions in chat box if you want. Let's start with the on uh, of population and sample. So population is uh, actually uh, the the set of or group of people about which we want to draw the conclusions. And sample is uh, the subset of the population or part that uh, actually we draw from the population. Uh, the procedure or the technique through which uh, we draw uh, the sample from the population is called sampling technique. Uh, I'm going to talk about different types of sampling techniques in uh, my upcoming slides. Uh, so that's why uh, it is important and uh, uh, what is the significance of uh, sample size, why we actually need to calculate sample size. Uh, I think we, we can recall, and this is the fact like uh, at some point in time, we, we as a researcher are unable to uh, study the entire population because uh, the population are of big size. They are, they are, uh, sometimes they are infinite. So that's why we need to take part of the population as a sample. We study the sample. We uh, uh, made uh, our results and we uh, develop or draw the findings and then based on those results and findings we extrapolate or generalize those findings to the population uh, so once we want to generalize uh, the findings or uh, that we have drawn from uh, the sample and population it is really important that your sample should be representative of the population and be representative if you want to, another important thing is the sample should be adequate. It should be adequate in size that you can, uh, 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 the, the results of the finding that you have drawn and you are going to generalize would be valid results. Uh, also, like uh, being researcher, it is uh, not possible. Like we uh, uh, we study the entire population because if you want to study the entire population, uh, we need a lot of resources, we need a lot of money, we need human power, we need a lot of time. So just because of these reasons, we study sample. Sample is easy to study, and uh, it is easy to collect the data from sample. Uh, okay, so uh, once you have calculated your uh, uh, desired sample size, uh, uh, then you actually need to uh, draw that sample from the population. The two major techniques that, that are uh, being used for uh, drawing the sample are called as probability sampling and non-probability sampling. In probability sampling, we have further four types, uh, which include simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, cluster sampling, systematic random sampling. And in non-probability sampling, we also have uh, four uh, types, uh, which include purposive sampling, convincing, quota, and so uh, When we talk about probability sampling, uh, this means in this type of sampling, each and every individual in the population has an equal chance to be selected as a sample. Uh, simple random sampling is uh, when you are trying to this uh, 
is something each and every individual do have equal chance to be selected. For example, if I am interested to study uh, uh, nursing students and I am drawing or taking 50 uh, students randomly from Isra College of Nursing. So that's what is a simple random sampling. Stratified random sampling is uh, a type of sampling in which you first uh, divide your population into stratas and then you take a proportionate sample from those stratas or subgroup as your sample. Uh, medical students at the Al Nafis Medical College. So first I am gonna divide the students into subgroups like first year student, second year student, third year, fourth year and fifth year. And then I'm gonna take a proportionate sample from all those certified random sampling. The next type is cluster sampling. Uh, sampling you need to uh, comb your uh, population into clusters. Uh, uh, for example, if I, I, I am interested to study uh, the vaccination status of uh, children under two years in a community, I'm going to take uh, five first town houses uh, 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 together uh, uh, where I can find the children under two years. So uh, 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 the, the uh, children there. Uh, the five or uh, five, seven or more houses that I'm going to cluster, uh, uh, that I'm going to comb are the cluster, and that is called as the cl cluster sampling. Systematic sampling is you are uh, drawing your sample through a systematic way, for example, um, selecting every nth number. It could be every fourth number, it could be every number and this is basically the uh, pre-decided and you actually the whole population uh, with your uh, selected sample size to get that nth number so this is probability sampling the limitation with this probability sampling is if you want to go with probability sampling you actually need to have a sampling frame uh, what is sampling frame? Sampling frame is the list of all the individual in the population. So all the times in all the situation, it is not possible to have the list of all those individuals. So we cannot go for probability. Okay, so Shahzad, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yes. So after doing it, please, could you repeat cluster sampling again? Because participants are asking about. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, yes, we can uh, repeat. I can repeat it right now. Or we can take it uh, in the questions as well, Russell. Uh, so, cluster sampling is in cluster sampling. First, we need to. Uh, I mean, we divide uh, the population into clusters. Uh, for example, as I uh, have given the example of uh, immunization status under two years of children. Uh, and I'm interested to find that in a community. I'll go into the community. I will, uh, you know, comb the houses, uh, five or seven houses all together where uh, I can find uh, the children under two years. So I will take uh, the data from that cluster and then I'll go to another cluster. So this way we are going to make cluster in the population to select our sample. Uh, so this could be done at the multi-stage. Maybe you are going to first select uh, uh, the the provinces randomly, then you are going to uh, go for uh, 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 the areas or the seals, and th this is the concept like that. And then you actually approach to the uh, the the community uh, through uh, a random way. Uh, can I? Okay. So so the. The other uh, sampling, as I was talking about, for probability sampling, you need to, you definitely need to have a sampling frame, which is a list of all the individuals. If you don't have the list of all the individuals, you cannot go for probability sampling. Uh, most probably, it is applicable, like uh, in organizational settings. If I am interested to uh, study the employees or maybe the healthcare professional in, in hospital, it is easy for me to get uh, the list of all the individuals. Uh, then. 
well, non-probability uh, something is the first thing is uh, per, the first type is purposive sampling. Uh, in purposive sampling, we have a predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, if, for example, I'm interested to study diabetic uh, people, so I'll select uh, uh, diabetic people based on my purpose. Convenient sampling, uh, sometimes it is also called as accidental sampling, uh, as it is evident from the name convenient. So uh, researchers select the sample based on uh, their opinions. Kuta uh, sampling is uh, somewhat similar to uh, stratified or cluster, but the difference here is in Kuta sampling, uh, you do not need to comb or cluster uh, your population, and also you can conveniently go to and get the pre predefined number. So this is what is called as quota sampling. Uh, the last one is the snowball sampling. Uh, it is uh, in this type of sampling, you select your sample base uh, through a snowball process. Like if you are uh, interested to study addicted person, so you you will try to find one addicted person and that addicted person will uh, serve as a source to tell you that you can find the other addicted person somewhere else. So this is how uh, this become a snowball. So you complete your uh, sample through. So these are two major types of uh, uh, sampling techniques through which you can draw the sample from population. And then uh, moving towards uh, parameters required for sample size estimation. And I believe like this is the most important part. Uh, these parameters are uh, knowing about your population size, uh, about the confidence interval, confidence level, standard deviation, and then you have to convert your confidence level into Z-scoring. Uh, additional thing, that are important are uh, uh, calculating power analysis or um, you know applying employing power analysis uh, which is applicable in few of the study designs uh, also you need to know about the outcome of your study uh, how you are mirroring your outcomes whether you are going to measure uh, your outcome on a continuous scale as uh, as a mean or you are going to measure uh, your outcome as proportion so all these things matter so i'm, gonna, I'm quickly gonna uh, give you an overview about uh, these parameters uh, so uh, population size so population size is uh, very simple as it it looks like uh, the total people you are talking about is population size. Uh, who does or does not fit into your research? If I am interested to uh, study about uh, patients uh, undergoing ca uh, cardiovascular surgery, I, I am not interested about cardiovascular events, including myocardial infarction or other cardiovascular events, but I am interested in cardiovascular surgery. So uh, then uh, is, it is uh, common to have an unknown number. Uh, you know, most of the times you, you may not be able to have a definite or known population size. So in, in those situations, you actually estimate you can take uh, uh, a rough estimation of the population size. Then uh, confidence interval, uh, which is also known as uh, margin of error, and uh, we call it as alpha error. Alpha error is a type one error in statistics. Uh, it is expressed as mean number and difference uh, you allow between uh, the sample mean and the mean of a population. So this is what you are actually predetermining determining before you are calculating your sample size. Usually we set uh, as a 5%. Uh, so 5% uh, is equal to, it will take the value of 0 0.05. Uh, so in statistics, uh, we use one is equal to 100%. Uh, so 5% is equal to 0.05%. So if I minus 5 from 100, which is equal to 95%. So confidence interval, and then there is a con confidence level. If the con 
confidence interval or a margin of error, I am setting it as 5%. I, I am uh, assigning 95% significance level, which is the next one. Here you can see uh, significance level or the confidence level. So this is basically, uh, uh, if I am 95%, if I am setting it 95%, which most of the time you are going to set, or you may set it as 99% or maybe 90%. If I am going to set this uh, uh, 95%, I am giving the margin of error as 5%. So what is that margin of error and confidence or uh, significance level? Uh, margin of error, as I said, like there is uh, a confidence interval, the interval of two values, the upper one and the lower one, with which uh, with a certain degree of confidence, I can say if I repeat the study multiple times, I am confident, I am 95 times confident my result will fall within this range. And if I uh, see it statistically, like I would be confident the probability of occurring the mean between this upper and lower range is 95%. And the probability of occurring the mean out of this range is, uh, is 5%. So uh, this is what we uh, represent it in a percentage. Uh, so larger the sample size, the more confident you can be about your uh, about your results that you are actually want want to generalize on your population. So uh, everything uh, you know end up on sample size. So we need to know uh, what is the adequate sample size. If your sample size is uh, too low, your result would not be valid to generalize. If uh, so, that's why you need to calculate uh, sample size. Then the other parameter is uh, standard deviation. Uh, standard deviation is actually the variation of responses from each other and from the mean. Uh, uh, so smaller the standard deviation, less variation uh, would be, uh, you would find the less variation if you are going to set the larger standard deviation, you are expecting there would be more variation uh, among the responses of the participant in your study. So on a safer side, we, we set it as 0 0.05, which is 5%. And uh, power of study uh, is uh, another parameter that we need to uh, determine, which refers to the number of, of uh, the participants required to avoid type 2 error. Uh, type 2 error is also known as beta error. And uh, the power of study is actually 1 minus beta error. We usually uh, set it as a T. So 1 minus beta, 1 minus 20 is equal to 80, but you can, uh, you know, adjust it accordingly. It all depends upon you. If you will increase your power, your chances of getting your sample size are uh, uh, the higher sample size, the chances of getting higher sample size is high. The more the power, the more the sample size. So all these things are going to be, uh, you know, uh, tackle and discussed by Faisal in, in uh, uh, his talk. So power in comparative clinical trials or comparative studies is important, but it is, it is not as important in uh, uh, survey design research. Uh, also, in, if you are conducting a diagnostic test or a diagnostic study, then you need to uh, set the power of your study. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now I'm uh, going to give uh, to Faisal. He's going to talk about study designs and uh, rest of the things. So over to you, Faisal. Do I need to stop here? Yeah, so that I can share my screen. So I think it would be better if I can. Yeah, you can share your screen now. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so perfect. 
So we we'll just briefly go over uh, study designs. We will not dive into details of each study design as it will take too much time. So I'll just introduce you to these study designs because it's important to understand them before we can just discuss about sample size estimation. Because sample size estimation and the type of uh, estimation methods or calculations that we apply, they also depend upon the type of study designs also. So we'll talk about that. So in brief, study designs are divided into two types. Categories one is observational and second is experimental. So in observational, so we briefly uh, subcategorize them into either descriptive or analytical. So in descriptive, so we get case reports and case series. For these, usually we don't need sample size. And for cross-sectional studies, of course we do. So that's very important and most commonly used also. And when we talk about analytical study designs, then there are also analytical cross-sectional studies and second are case control studies and cohort studies. So why we call them observational study designs? Because we are not applying any intervention on our study participants. So we are just observing them for the outcome. That's it. So when we talk about experimental study design, so we basically have either uh, non-randomized controlled trials or randomized controlled trials. So in these trials, so we then have further categorizations of parallel designs and crossover designs. So if you are interested, you can read about the. We have non-inferiority trials. It is important to subdivide them into these because in clinical trials, all these non-inferiority, equivalence, and superiority have their own parameters and their own, I should say, like requirements for sample size estimation. So since this is beyond the scope of today's session, so we will not go into details about these designs and how do we calculate sample sizes for each of these trial designs. Moving to the next. So sample size are calculated based on study designs, but there is also a second approach, which is also emerged from the different study designs. For example, let's, if, if we talk about cross-sectional study designs, so usually the outcome which we estimate or measure in, in cross-sectional studies are proportions, mean, and odds ratios. Proportions are usually prevalences, for example, we, when we want to estimate prevalence of some disease, let's say in a population-based survey, your aim is to perform a cross-sectional study in which your outcome is to estimate, for example, prevalence of hypertension in a population. So then it means your outcome is a proportion or in epidemiological terms, prevalence. And for that, you need to understand that your outcome which you are measuring here is a proportion. For that, a sample size calculation is different. But there are other ways also of calculating sample size. Second way is, again, if your objective is to estimate mean of some uh, measure. For example, if you want to estimate average blood pressure, systolic blood pressure in the population, then it means your outcome which you are measuring is in terms of mean values. So for that, again, sample size estimation would be different. And it also we come across that in cross-sectional study designs, we also look at the association between outcome and different factors. For example, if you are uh, interested in looking at comparing hypertension between male and females, and then it means the outcome here would be your odds ratios. So we can't go into details of how to measure these outcomes because then it would be too lengthy. So we will just avoid those and we hope that you understand all these basic concepts. So what my point here is that everything depends upon the type of outcome. So if you understand your outcome, it means it really uh, helps you to understand how are you gonna approach 
do your sample size estimation and how will you calculate. So coming to the case control studies. So case control studies are their main purpose is always to to explore a different uh, how should I say risk factors yeah and exposures. So, and those are measures of our association. So those are measured in terms of odds ratios. So when we, whenever you have a case control study design, so you can be sure that the sample size estimation which will be needed would be for odds ratios. Coming to cohort study designs. So cohort study designs are a bit diverse in which your outcome can be a measure of association which are measured in three ways. First, odds ratios, which is similar to case control and cross section studies. And then risk ratios or relative risk. And third are hazard ratios. So you have to understand that there is a bit of difference between risk ratio and hazard ratio. So risk ratio is like overall difference in risk between exposure and non-exposure group, while hazard ratio is called as an instantaneous risk that is occurring between exposure and non-exposure group. So that's uh, technically and statistically it is estimated in a different way. That's why I have put it in as separate columns. Otherwise, it belongs to the same category of risk ratio. So coming to clinical trials, so they are most diverse in terms of studies. Hello, Shazad, can you mute and participant, please? I am trying. I am trying. Farah, can you please mute yourself? Yes, you can mute Shazad. design in terms of having different types of outcomes. Like if you are conducting a clinical trial, so and you can estimate proportions, you can compare diff different proportions, you can compare different means, and you also have measures of association, such as odds ratios, risk ratios, and hazard ratios. So again, I would just summarize this, that your sample size estimation depends upon your study design and second, the type of outcome which you measure in your study. So how do we know that what, what type of outcome do we have? So it depends upon your research question or study objective. So if you understand that well, if you have generated a research question, then things are easier than you. That go that serve as a guide for you to estimate a sample size for you. So once you have a well-established research question, then you can set your parameters and estimate sample sizes. And then, but still, you have to figure out what type of sample size estimation you are going to perform. So we will work through different scenarios, and I hope things would be uh, more clearer to you while doing this. So uh, coming to our first situation, which is a uh, very common epidemiological study design of uh, cross-sectional surveys. And we will estimate the sample size for a cross-sectional survey. For example, uh, in this scenario, a researcher wishes to measure the prevalence of any Indian children who are aged 6 to 59 months. And based on previous data, the prevalence of anemia in this age group is 39.8%. So you want to, for example, replicate such kind of study and you want to estimate what is this exact sample size or minimum sample size which you need in order to uh, measure the prevalence of anemia in your study. So what are the parameters that you need to estimate your sample size? Of course, the foremost is your proportion or prevalence in other words, which is 39.8%. 
And second, you require this margin of error. And third, your confidence level. So as a researcher, it's your choice how much margin of error and confidence level you want to set in your sample size estimation. Remember, when you are doing a population service, you usually do not need power. Power is mostly required for measures of association and clinical trials because those are uh, clinically more important because when you are comparing interventions and measures of association, so you need to make sure that you have adequate power to detect the difference between uh, measures of association when there is a difference. So I'll try to take you uh, to the software for samples are estimation, and for this we would be needing Open Appy. I hope you are familiar with Open Appy software. So, can you see my screen? Uh, no, Faisal, we can't. We just uh, we can only see your PowerPoint. I think you need to I share, sure. and then you need to share it again. Okay, so sure. I'll do that. You are on other screen. Okay. Just stop here. Yes. yes. So I I redo it. Can you see now? Yes. So this is our Open Appy software. It's a free website and software. It's called openappy.com. So it has certain options for sample size calculation and running some different statistics. So I hope you will be able to follow me. So if you look at this uh, navigation, it states sample size, so there are different options for sample size estimation. Since we are doing a survey and we are interested in estimating uh, prevalence of anemia in our study, so I'll just click on this. Shazad, there is one query, so can you just look at that? And uh, yeah, yeah, I can look. Uh, you just uh, continue, and uh, later we can take all these questions. Okay, sure. So then you can enter your data here. So that calculator will be open. So the first state's population size. We are not going to navigate that or make any changes in that. We'll talk about it later. So then second uh, rule ask for the anticipated frequency. Since in our previous publication, we know that the prevalence of anemia is 39. Sorry, just let me have a look at, yeah, 39.8. So I'll just write 39.8. And our confidence limit or margin of error is five. So it's already set as five. So we will keep that. And then there's third, which is called design effect. So design effect is only applied when you are using multi-stage uh, sampling methods like cluster sampling. So if you're using simple or systematic random sampling methods, so all you have to do is to just keep it as one here. You don't have to change. And we will keep our population size as infinite here. And if you press calculate, then you will get your sample size. So if you can see the screen here, you will see that our sample size at the confidence level of 95% is 369. And if we reduce our confidence level, here you see that your sample size also drops significantly. And if you choose 90% confidence level, then it's 260. So here, it means that your sample size of population surveys heavily depends upon the confidence level which you choose. But usually, as Shahzad already mentioned, that the ideal confidence level which we choose is 95%. So it is not recommended to use below that, but if it's a population survey, of course you can do that too. But if you see that if you use confidence level which is higher than 95, that is 99%, then your sample size is almost double to that of 95% and so on if you see that. so. So this is a very simple and easy way to calculate sample size when your 
objective or research question is to estimate the prevalence of some disease or some occurrence or some event, or in other words, proportions. So coming to the second scenario, I'll reshare the screen again. So here, just to conclude, based on the previously estimated global prevalence of anemia of 39.8% and assuming the margin of error of 55% and confidence level of 95%, the required sample size to estimate the prevalence in our study is 369 participants. I hope I was clear enough. So now moving to the second situation, or most common situation which we encounter in our sample size estimation is when we are comparing two proportions. For example, in this situation, a researcher wants to compare the prevalence of anemia between boys and girls aged 6 to 59 months. And previous studies or previous data show that the prevalence of anemia in boy was 32.6%. And in girl was 39.9%. So here, once again, what's the situation here? Situation is that we have to compare the prevalence of anemia between two groups. One group is boys and other group is girls. So we call this situation a comparison of proportions. Since there are two proportions here, so we'll just focus on the proportions. But remember, there can be more than two proportions. And those can also be estimated for. For this kind of situation, so unfortunately, a info uh, cannot calculate sample size for comparing proportions. So we'll use another freely available calculator. And I will show you that in a moment. Sorry guys, I actually can't see my screen, so it has vanished. Bear with me, please. Yeah, here it comes. Shazad, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. So this is a, f a free sample size estimator from Cleveland Clinic. So it, it gives you uh, a sample size calculator for mostly clinical trials, but some observational studies also like cohort study, case control study, and cross-section study as well. Since our was a cross-section study, so you can click the option of cross-section study here. And then, there are two options. So it, it is asking me whether your outcome is continuous or outcome is proportion. Since we are comparing two proportions in our current scenario. So I will just click on proportional outcome. And then the first option, if you look at here, it is asking for the margin of error. So we'll keep margin of error as five power 80%. And it, it is asking for a ratio of first sample to second sample. Like how many participants, like do you want to recruit equal number of participants in each group or unequal? So you can adjust that ratio. But for now, we'll just keep it one. Like we want to keep an equal number of participants in both groups. So P1 is proportion one. So in our scenario, our proportion one was prevalence of anemia in boys, which is 32 0.6%, so I will write 0.326 here. 0 0.32 because proportions are usually in, in decimals. And second, which are girls, so the prevalence of anemia according to the previous study was 0.39 or 39.9%. See, so that's it. So all you have to do is to set all the parameters and calculate the sample size. And if you see at the bottom here. So the sample size which is required here 
is that 707 participants in each group and in total around 1400 participants so now let's change a bit of parameters and play around with it for example you realize that this sample is actually too big for you to conduct a study on so that's a bit of a problem so you you are thinking about reducing your sample size let's say so let's increase our margin of error and then see what happens here the rest of the parameters are same proportions are the same just i have increased margin of error and then we will calculate the sample size so if you see here that your sample size has significantly dropped so what we can conclude from here is that if you increase your margin of error or inflate your margin of error it means your sample size will drop and let's keep all other parameters the same. And now let's increase the power from 80% to 90%. So it means that I want more robust or more confirm, more power in my study to estimate the difference between these two proportions. If you recalculate your sample size based on the alpha error of 10%, which is 0 0.10, and the power of 90%, See, again, sample size has inflated. So either you can choose 741 or 769, but you can choose the go for the first one. But see, sample size has again increased from 1100 something up to 1400 something. So it, what can we conclude from here? That if we want to achieve higher power, it means as Shazad said before, we need more sample size in order to do that. Suppose still these are a bigger, uh, still it's a bigger sample size. So you want to go back to power of 80 and type error, alpha error of 10%. Um, but you uh, want to... Sorry to interrupt you, Faisal. Uh, can you please name this software? The current it's, one you are using? Yeah, yeah, it's Cleveland Clinic Risk Calculator. If you can Google it, you can easily find it now. Right. Cleveland Thanks. Clinic Sample Size Calculator. It's freely available. All of you can just Google it and it will uh, show and you can just navigate it and use it. So I was talking about like, still we think that that sample size is big enough for us. So then you can, another way which you can just troubleshoot your sample size, or if you want to decrease it, that you may want to find a more recent study. Since these were global estimates, so if there is some study, let's say in, in Pakistan or in, or in your own country, and you know that uh, the estimates are different in those, for example, in boys, you have found the prevalence of, let's say, 40% of anemia. And in girls, so probably, let's say it's around 56%. So see, these proportion estimates have changed. So now what matters here for sample size estimation is difference of these two proportions here. So larger the difference means smaller the sample size required for your study. So the smaller the difference means larger the sample size is. So let's calculate it. See, now your sample size has significantly dropped from 1100 to 264 in total. So why is that so? Because previously, the difference in proportions according to the previous data were only 8%. And now this difference between 40% and 56% is around 16 persons. So that's why your sample size, which you require for your study, in order to detect the significant difference between these two groups, only 264 participants are needed. So I would suggest you to just play around with it, change the statistics so that you can get the feel of how to change the parameters according to your feasibility, according to your availability of resources. And also it depends upon the size of population where you are uh, conducting your study. For example, just an example, 
if you have only 300 um, artists uh, population and your sample size is 264 then probably too unrealistic so then there is an option for adjusted sample size we haven't shared it but you can easily find it in google it and you will find it like how to calculate adjusted sample size for your study and it will give you a formula it is very simple or we can also provide you in the presentation later so i will move to the next scenario now i hope i'm not going too fast Okay, now, can you see my screen, Chesa? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So now I'm moving to the next scenario, which is also another common uh, encounter, common objective of most of the studies in which the purpose of researcher is to compare two means. So coming to this scenario, a researcher wishes to know whether oral contraceptive use affects the average systolic blood pressure. Previous study, or in this case, I have chosen a pilot study by, you, by yourself, shows that the mean systolic blood pressure of oral contraceptive users was 132, while non-contraceptive user was 127. So since you have that data and now you want to calculate this exact sample size which you require in order to conduct your study. So what are the parameters in this situation required to estimate your sample size? So first, of course, mean systolic blood pressure in group one, which is oral contraceptive users, mean systolic blood pressure in second group, and then their corresponding standard deviations. And again, sorry, again, the margin of error which you will set uh, is five percent or 0 0.05 confidence level 95 percent and power 80 percent so i'll go to the calculator again and we'll calculate so going to the same calculator by the way you can calculate your sample size from Happy info also because happy info also gives the option for comparing two means. So you can do that. But in this situation, now our outcome is continuous. So we will just click on the continuous outcome and then we will calculate our sample size. So mean one, which is our oral contraceptive users, so our sample size is one. 132.8 and for second it is 127.4 margin of error is five persons power is already 80 person and we want equal number in each group and here if you see standard deviation it is asking what is the expected standard deviation if you notice in our a situation we had two standard deviation one was 15.31 group and other was 18.2 the simplest approach to solve this problem is uh, add 15.3 and 18 plus 2 divide it by 2 and then you will get the common standard deviation or pooled standard deviation between two group. so i assume that it is 16 and then we will calculate the sample size As you can see here, that in each group you require around 138 participants. So what does it mean? That minimum 276 people are needed to, to study the different, every difference in blood pressure between oral contraceptive users versus non-oral contraceptive users. Again, if you want to explore more, that how the parameters will affect this sample size, so you can just change the standard deviation, for example, I, I may want to just make it 30. And then if you recalculate, and then you will see that the more the variation, higher the sample size is needed. And simply, if you increase the difference between these two means, your sample size will drop. 
If you increase the power, sample size will increase. And if you decrease your alpha error, sorry, I mean inflate your alpha error like from 5% to 10%, again, your sample size is going to be affected. So I would suggest you to just change these values at your convenience so that you can understand how different parameters can affect your sample size. I won't do it in happy info. I'm sure you can do it on your own. It's, it's very intuitive and easy to work with. So I'll go to the presentation again. And now a sample size estimation for a case control study. So in this scenario, a researcher wishes to measure the magnitude of association between smoking and coronary heart disease, heart disease a classic association. So previous study shows that 76% of people with CHD are smokers, while 50% of people without CHD are smokers. So in addition, the odds of CHD among smokers are 3.17 times higher than non-smokers. And now, what are the parameters which are required for your sample size estimation? You require odds ratio, which is given, so 3.17. Percentage of uh, people with CHD who are smokers, that is 76%. And percentage of CHD who are non-smokers, that is 50%. Again, alpha level, so I have chosen the standard 5%. Confidence level, 95%. Power, 80%. So it's important to understand that in order to calculate sample size for case control study, you need to get the information regarding the association of this outcome in any previous study. So I'm sure you can get it. And on, in addition to that, you need to get the proportions also, as I have mentioned here, between cases and controls. So here, if you notice here, we are talking about proportions of exposures, not the outcome. See, like percent age of smokers in those who have CHD, they, these are cases, and those who are non-CHD, these are controls. So you have to understand this technical difference here, please. So now let's uh, calculate the sample size based on these parameters. I'll move to I guess happy info. And let me share the screen. So can they see the screen? Yes. Okay. So here, if you look at this in sample size estimation, first was proportion. Second is unmatched case control. So we just choose the option for unmatched case control. And then it asks to enter data. So I'll enter the data. So as we said, the confidence level was 95%, power 80%, ratio of controls to cases. We, we will just choose it as equal for now. But you can change it also. So that's not a problem. And percent of controls were exposed here. So what? who are our controls in our scenario? Those are the people who do not have CHD. And what is our exposure group here? Those who are smoker. So what is the proportion of uh, smokers among non-CHD people? That is 50%, so I'm just gonna put 50 here. And then it is asking for odds ratio. I just put odds ratio here. And then this software automatically actually uh, fills in the other information, but we we'll see it has automatically calculated the other information. So we don't have to put it by master. If you press calculate, so you have the sample size. If you look at the sample size, which is required for cases, usually we choose fly or you, but you can do this one also, but it, it doesn't matter much. There is not much difference. So you need 53 participants in each uh, case and controls. So in total, 106 participants are needed to measure the association of smoking with CHD. So if you want to change some parameter, for example, if you want to increase the power to 90%, so let's have a look at that too. 
See, your sample size has inflated from 53 to 71 in each group. If you look at it here. Similarly, if you will increase your alpha error, so sample size is going to drop. So now let's move to our last scenario. Then, of course, we'll take question and we can discuss further. So sample size estimation for a cohort study. So as if you remember, cohort study has can do measures of association for both odds ratios as well as for relative risk and hazard ratios. But here we will just, uh, sorry, just let me. Sorry, coming back to this. So researcher wants to measure the magnitude of association between smoking and incidence of coronary heart disease. Previous data show that the incidence of coronary heart disease among smokers was 40% as compared to 14% in non-smokers. If you see here that this situation is a bit different from all ratio. Data are the same, but the way we want to approach this sample size estimation is different. Now, what? because it's a cohort study, so it means participants who were smokers and non-smokers were followed over a period of time, and then they were measured for the presence of CSD over time. So that's, in this situation, we can measure incidence of coronary heart disease among smokers as compared to non-smokers. So let's calculate the sample size for this. Sorry, previously, the risk ratio or relative risk for CSD among smokers as compared to non-smokers was 2.86. So uh, let's go to the epi info again. share the screen. So if you go to the Epi Info software, you will see that there is this third option, which is which says cohort or RCT. So I'll just click on cohort, and it will take me to this pane, and I'll click on enter data. And if you look at the confidence levels, we just keep it 95%. Power, let's say, keep it 80% ratio of unexposed to exposed will keep the same ratio between two groups percent of unexposed with outcome so what was the percent of unexposed with outcome it was 14 percent so i'll just click here 14 and risk ratio is 2.86 and percent of exposed with outcome, it has automatically calculated. And it has automatically estimated all ratios also. So all you have to do is to just click here, calculate. And then you will get your sample size here. So here it says in exposed, I mean smokers, you need 45 people. And also non-exposed, meaning non-smokers, you need 45. So in total, you need a sample of 90 people. So let's say this time you want to increase your confidence level from 95% to 99%. So let's see what happens here. See, the sample size has inflated from 45 to 67. So here we can see here, if you want to have higher confidence level, it means you need to have a larger sample size as compared to the situation when you want to have a lower confidence level. Similarly, you can play around and you can also change the ratio also. For example, let's say we want to change the ratio here to from one to two. Like you want two participants for each uh, exposure group in your non-exposure group. So let's all calculate it. See, the number remains same in the unexposed, but in exposed group means smokers. But in unexposed, it's it's double of the size because you chose to I mean you decided that you want two participants for each of uh, one participant for each polar group. So that's it for now. 
I know it was like a marathon, like probably it was too fast for uh, most of you people. But I hope we were able to uh, give you something so that you can just walk in terms of sample size calculation and understand. So if you have any questions, so please, we are here to answer those questions. So that should we go for the question in the chat box first? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we can start uh, from the chat box. Okay. Uh, just, I'm gonna start with the first one. Okay. So, it, it's uh, start from, uh, it start from Dr. Kola. Uh, uh, okay. Dr. Kola says like, uh, if we can uh, record this session, uh, we apologize, uh, Dr. Kola, for uh, not recording the session because we were unable to record uh, that session. But uh, I hope uh, 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 we have covered the basics and uh, uh, basic uh, things related to sample size calculation. And if you do have any questions further, you can contact uh, contact uh, Professor or even me. Uh, we can share our email here. And then, uh, can you please repeat uh, cluster sampling? Uh, Johnson asked this question. Johnson, uh, did I answer your question or uh, do you need uh, further explanation? So just an addition. So please don't confuse yourself with the term cluster. Cluster can be anything. Cluster can be one nursing college that can be taken as an entire cluster. And if you want to compare that to another college, it means these are two clusters. Cluster can be a classroom. Cluster can be a group of any people who are sharing some common goal or, or some common characteristics. So we use term cluster mostly in epidemiological study designs. So if you have read uh, population surveys like demographic health surveys, or multiple indicator cluster surveys in which maternal mortality ratios are. So these are usually uh, mostly uh, cross-sectional, large population-based cross-sectional surveys. Because population is so large, you cannot actually sample everyone. So that's why you design these multi-stage surveys. So in which you select cluster, and within those clusters, you can, of course, select the participants. So that's why it is called cluster sampling. It is less accurate. That's why you need larger samples if you choose cluster sampling design. So if you want to know more about it, I would suggest you to uh, read about it. It's very interesting. And also, if you notice that if you have read, clinical trials can also be clustered trials. So clinical trials, but again, that's a sampling methodology mainly. Why it is important to incorporate into your sample size calculation because if you're using uh, these multiple stage uh, sampling methods it means you require larger sample size it introduces the bias which is called design effect so normal design effect is one so if these are multiple uh, stage sampling it means you need to increase your design effect level in order to address the bias of, of that multi-stage sample i hope i was a bit clearer. Yeah, and uh, Johnson said uh, we have uh, answered his question. Uh, then there was a question from Hassan Karim, which is the most reliable sampling uh, and has less biasness. Uh, so as I mentioned, like probability sampling is one of the ideal way, and in probability sampling, the simple random sampling is the ideal uh, sampling for uh, uh, sampling technique for uh, selecting your sample, but it's not possible to do uh, simple random sampling in all the situation just because you don't have uh, a sampling frame or the list of all the individuals. Say, for example, if I am interested uh, to study about the use of helmet among uh, motorbike riders uh, in, in a province, so would it be possible for me to get the list of all the motorcycle or motorbike riders? Uh, uh, of course, it would not be. So in those situations, uh, we go for uh, non-probability sampling. But the ideal way, I mean, in real ideal world, well, you should have to go for a uh, simple 
run on something. Uh, Hassan, if you have a uh, uh, question, more questions uh, about this, you can uh, ask once we finish with the chat box. So, yes, Faisal, you all already answered this as well. Uh, got it. Thanks. Well, we are working. And then there was a question from Johnson. We are working on interventional studies now. Requesting you to please explain use of power and other uh, related parameters as well. Um, uh, Faisal has explained it uh, in detail about all these uh, designs, including the you know comparative analysis about the randomized control trials. And I hope Johnson, this uh, has answered your question. If you still has, uh, uh, if you still have question, you can ask uh, once we finish. Yeah, just just to add. Please remember, interventional studies are most of the time, they, are, they should be very robust. Because when you are trying to compare intervention more than two, then you need to be more stringent about your sample size estimation. So then usually higher power is required and you need a reliable previously published data. If that's not available, then second option is your pilot study. But you can't find your way around that. I mean, because interventional studies, especially which are related to diagnostic or pharmaceutical studies related to interventions or comparing some drug treatment therapy. So you need to be very, very careful. And also there are different subtypes of clinical trials and interventional studies. So you need to understand those so that you can apply appropriate sample size calculated to estimate your sample size. Remember, I just showed you these two software. There are so many. There are paid versions. There are free versions. So it's it's your choice. Which one to use? So being researchers, we cannot recommend you which one to use because there are so many. And we are not vouching for, for any particular organization or sample size calculator. That's really up to you. Personally, I use Stata software. So which has a built-in sample size calculator for almost every scenario and situation, so I use that. But I haven't shared uh, with you any of the data example or how to calculate this data, because most of uh, you might have not stayed with you. So that's why I just chose three versions. But more or less, all of them will give you the same sample size. But remember, the parameters which I give you in those scenarios are actually required by most of the softwares. If someone asked a question that not all parameters are needed. Actually, all parameters are needed. Some calculators and some calculators may not need it. So that's why it is important for you to get all the information of those parameters so that you know that you have that information. And even if your sample size calculator doesn't need it, you still have to report it in your manuscript or protocol, like which parameters did you choose? So that, for example, if I have seen your protocol, I can have a look at that protocol and calculate the sample size and see whether you have calculated your sample size in a right. And then uh, we have a question from Hassan Karim uh, uh, about, for instance, the proposal portion of previous data is not known to us, then what we will do? So I, I replied to him like, uh, Hassan, we can go for uh, uh, a small scale pilot study as uh, Faisal mentioned, because uh, you know research is uh, a systematic way. And when we talk about uh, 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 Size you the uh, sample size uh, when uh, you are taking it as a 50 percent. But um, uh, I usually recommend like we should have to go for small, uh, small yeah, scale. I, I, I just, do so. That's uh, more appropriate. Yeah, just to make it more scientific. Yeah. So we can do a small for pilot study while calculating prevalence uh, what will be the denominator so Faisal, would you like to answer this uh, this is a question from dr kola 
the denominators always are the population in which you are uh, doing your study. Even if you are doing a pilot study, so you still know your population. Like, for example, if you're doing it on nursing students, let's say, then it, you know that the total number of the students and the number you study. So, and the prevalence which you will get from that study, actually, for example, if you have for your pilot, if you have chosen 10 people out of 10, let's say three people develop that outcome. It means three divided by 10. So that's the prevalence which you have got. So for example, it's around 30%. Then that 30% you will plug it in your sample size calculator and you will estimate your sample size. Yeah. Thank you, Faisal. Then there is a question from uh, Asisha and he mentioned actually about uh, all these parameters. If we don't have any of these parameters, including risk ratio uh, from the previous literatures, how we will, how we are going to go to calculate the sample size? Again, it's a pilot study. Yeah. The best way is to do a pilot study. Pilot study serves so many purposes. It's not only about sample size. It has many fold benefits, which we probably don't want to talk about in detail. But if you read pilot, it's, it's, it's so much more than just a sample size estimation guide. It tells you how feasible your study is, what are the potential hurdles which you will encounter in your studies, and also if the tool, the very tool which you are using to calculate whether that can be modified or not, and yeah. so on. And you know, people publish pilot studies. Unfortunately, this is so untrue, or it doesn't happen in our in our part of the world. But here, where I am working, <clears throat> sorry, we publish so many pilot studies. Like we do pilot clinical trial, and we publish that. And journals are happy to take that because yeah, they know that it is important. Yeah, and there's a few of the parameters as we discuss in our uh, presentations, like they are uh, preset. If we talk about confidence yes. level alpha, we do not need to, uh, you know, take all these from the literature. Yeah. Yeah. This is what we have to set, what we want to uh, achieve. Uh, and definitely a few of the parameters, like if we are not performing, uh, uh, clinical trials or comparative study, we do not need to know about the power of the study. We do not need to set that. Yeah, so that's why not all the parameters are actually required, but we need to know all these para parameters uh, when we are calculating sample size. There is a question from Ikra. Sir, if we have under 40 sample size for quasi-experimental study, is this justifiable, calculated by... ...WHO would be even justified if it is less than uh, uh, 40, but this should be calculated based on scientific principles. Uh, the parameters you are entering for calculation of uh, uh, the sample size should be valid, uh, no matter what what number you are getting. Uh, so would you like to add anything? No, I think that's absolutely fine. Even we have for clinical trials for 10 participants. We yes. calculate sample size and we say that 10 participants are enough to test this hypothesis. We go with that. That's simple. Because whatever you can justify scientifically is absolutely the right approach. But if you're just doing it from the top of your head, then that's not appropriate. Yes, and then there is a question from Humera. Please share the name of the sample size software, uh, software name. So we have already mentioned that name and you can uh, go, it's very easy, it's really available on Google and you can go and find that. So I will just put, put some names also in the chat box for you uh, so that you all can just have a look at it. But these are just the name of some uh, person. Personally, I like R because I'm an R user. R is a language. It's, it's a complete language. It has almost everything related to statistics. So I use uh, R as data. But R is free, but it's, it's a steep learning curve. So it's difficult for the people who are from non-statistics backgrounds, it's difficult for them to comprehend and follow. But 
Of course, when you go to a biostatistician, the probability they are going to use R. Uh, or and pro probably stata as well. The, the yeah, stata as well. Software yeah. and, yes, there is another question from Dr. Kola. We run pilot study on RMU and uh, allied hospitals on elderly females. We include females from uh, three allied hospitals or RMU. I want to ask while calculating the prevalence, what would be the total population in our study we found problem in 20 ladies out of uh, total elderly females reporting to OPD for three hospitals in in duration of two months so you are uh, Dr. Kola you are focusing on elderly ladies uh, uh, what is your outcome your prevalence would be I'm not sure what is your outcome. If you are uh, trying to find the diabetes in uh, elderly ladies, uh, you need to know, uh, you need to uh, take a rough estimation of uh, the diabetic ladies, elderly diabetic ladies in, in, in your area. That would be a rough estimation. We cannot say anything if it is not known. In developed countries, we can easily find uh, some sort of statistics because they record each and everything uh, on databases. But if it is not reported in, in, in the local databases, uh, we need to make a rough estimation. My question, Sir Faisal, uh, this is from Asif Shah, okay. but there is no question uh, Asif, if you can unmute yourself and you can yeah, ask this question. Asif? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is down there. Uh, just elaborate power of a test. Uh, power of a test or power of a sample size? Yeah, he has written power of a test. Asif, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Okay, sample size. Actually, power is, is, is it's very simple. Don't confuse yourself. It's just the ability to detect the difference when actually there is a difference. Okay? What do I mean by that? So it's, it's very simple that if there is a difference, then you should be able to find the difference. And for that, you need an adequate sample size. So that's your main objective of calculating sample size because sometimes if assume that you have taken a small sample size and actually in reality the two groups for example like those who are over contraceptive users versus non-users there is a difference in their systolic blood pressure but you have chosen a small sample size for example let's say you have studied on 20 people and then you didn't find any difference and then you, in your study, you concluded that there was no difference between uh, or uh, in blood pressure between two groups. So how would you know that that study was adequately powered up? It's very simple. If you go to open up your other software, they will give you option either to calculate sample size or power. Okay, so what will I do to test the uh, passive swab whether it, it is adequately powered or not? I plug in the values of blood pressure by a mix between groups, and then I will enter the sample size, and then I'll calculate the power. Suppose it has given me that power is 54 percent. So what would I conclude? So my conclusion here is that ASIF study was underpowered, meaning sample size was not large enough to detect the difference when actually there is a difference. Yeah, so Similarly, then, study can also be overpowered. So, so you don't want to even overpower your study or underpower your study. So that's why we use the term adequate power. Like sample size should be large enough to detect the difference when there is. But sometimes it happens that there is no clinically significant difference, but statistically you find a difference. For example, if blood pressure has been over-the-counter users is like 132 and non-users is 130. For example, at the sample of 50, you might uh, find that it's insignificant. There is no difference. But trust me, if you choose a sample of 500 people and then compare the same number of 
and same blood pressure in those 500, you will find that difference is significant. So what does this mean? So it means your study is overpowered. So here you encountered an error. So that's actually classic null hypothesis testing issues. So this is a statistical problem. So you want to avoid that. And that's why it's also very, very important to understand the clean clinical aspect of your sample size as well as your research. Not everything is statistics based. Yeah, this is what we call as uh, statistical yeah. significance and then clinical significance. Clinical significance. Yeah. So there is a difference between, they should be aligned. If they're not aligned, then you should think about your statistical significance. Because not everything which is statistically significant means that it is clinically significant as well. Yes. Uh, the next question is uh, from Johnson, and this question is uh, related to, to the power as well. How much power okay. or test we can increase in interventional studies to get adequate sample size and to minimize chance of error? Uh, or it is, it is enough. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, you can increase your power to 90% uh, 90 as well in uh, interventional studies but remember like uh, you know uh, if you will increase uh, too much of your power uh, your chances of uh, getting alpha ever will increase so you need to balance both these uh, alpha and uh, beta errors if you will uh, not maintain the balance between these two there, there will be a problem so 80 or if you want to increase it you can go uh, to 90 as well to achieve uh, 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 to just to find uh, uh, the difference but for that definitely your sample size will increase uh, can you share what is your take with sampling in relation to the use of inferential statistics there are some that highlight use of inferential statistics require probability sampling and never non probability sampling thank you very much i didn't get that uh, no, this is what I'm getting. Actually, uh, she is. Uh, our question is I don't know uh, whose question is this. It's M E G. So uh, yes, definitely probability sampling. Uh, this is this has been mentioned in in the literature. Like if you want to generalize uh, your findings to uh, to your population, uh, you you should go for probability sampling and as i mentioned probability sampling is the ideal one uh, why because it it gives random chance and uh, random randomization is uh, an other way but that is different to to do the sampling if if we want to uh, if we want to uh, minimize the bias, randomization, randomization is one of the way, and uh, this is one way to reduce systematic error as well. So this is somewhat right about inferential uh, statistics. If we want to extrapolate, probability sampling is more applicable as compared to non-probability sampling. But again, it's it's about the limitations of all these situations. Somewhere we can go for probability sampling, but uh, uh, not in all the situation we can go for uh, probability sampling. So we have to go for non-probability sampling in those situations. So free calculators, here is uh, Mr. Purcell, power of sample, size, then uh, it is Asif Shah, who said power of sample size. Yeah, that's what he, we talked about. Yes. So that's, that's uh, thank you so much, uh, Sir Faisal, for explanation about the uh, power of the sample size. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, we have uh, not good bio, biostatistic background. Uh, what are helping material for us to learn or get help? Uh, I believe, like uh, starting with the uh, with the understanding or like. Learning the basics of biostatistics will really help, and then you can build on. And uh, uh, biostatistics or statistics are all about uh, 
application. Mm -hmm. If you will apply these concepts, you will understand and you will retain those concepts. If you will not, you, you would not be able to keep them. Thank you very much. Uh, it is highly appreciated. Uh, Abo, we need more webinar this time. Uh, we don't have uh, any more question here in the chat box. Okay, so uh, do we have any other question here? I, I don't think so. Okay. So, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining. Uh, if you want to join Pakistan Nursing Research Society, uh, you can get uh, our uh, email. I'm just going to share it uh, my screen again, uh, just to give you. Here is uh, the email address uh, for Pakistan Nursing Research Society. If you want, sorry, yes. If you want to uh, become a member, you can send us uh, uh, an email with your name, uh, with your organization, and a short paragraph about uh, why you want to join Pakistan Nursing Research Society. So again, thank you so much uh, uh, for your participation and uh, being having with us. Thank you, first of all. Welcome. I hope it was fruitful. Yeah.